All right, so the main lecture that we had for this uh, topic, I, didn't, I don't think I did quite enough coverage of how to, to find the centroid of a shape by integration. I did cover it a little bit in there, kind of talked about how a lot of the shapes that are in the table that you use for a lot of your integration stuff, or excuse me, a lot of your centroid stuff, uh, do come out of integration type of um, evaluation, right? But uh, in your homework and, and also uh, on quizzes, you're going to be accountable to being able to find certain centroids by using uh, integration techniques. And so I figured I'd cover one that was like that today. And um, one of the really cool things about this is that your calculator, your, uh, if you have a Casio uh, FX 115 ES Plus, or if you have the 991 EX, uh, and also the 36X Pro, those calculators have some tools built into them that make this uh, relatively easy to do. It's again, one of those that looks tricky, but once you learn how to use your calculator, um, it makes them not so bad. So I figured I'd kind of give you a demonstration of that with this uh, example problem right here. So here it is. It says, find the X and Y locations of the centroid of the shaded shape the upper boundary of which is given with the equation below, and the lower boundary is the x-axis. So that'd be this kind of line down here. All right. Um, and uh, we're given the choices there for, uh, for the x-centroid as well as for the y-centroid. And here is the equation of the curve. y of x is equal to 21 millimeters plus 4x minus 0.25 times x cubed over millimeters squared minus 0 0.03 x to the fourth over millimeters cubed. Now, the first thing that I think generally throws people off in these problems is the fact that I very often will include units with the problem, and that's not something that often happens probably in your math classes, all right? But there, it is appropriate to do that, all right? And I wanna kinda show you first thing, you know, how this all works and why it is that we need these units in here to make this equation, you know, truly technically valid, okay? So think of it this way. Both X and Y are essentially the, the uh, axes along which you are going to be measuring the shape itself, right? And so since you're measuring and, and your X and Y are your spatial coordinates, right, that you're measuring um, things like where are you located along this curve, it makes sense that they would be measured with lengths, right? I mean, otherwise it's hard to think of what they would be measured in, right? They would be measured in lengths. And uh, because of that, you need for the units of Y to be in units of length, and you also need the units of X to be in units of length. If they're not, it just, the shape itself doesn't really make sense. So, um, you know, X is probably easier for us to think about because it's independent. You can kind of say it's the independent variable. You can say, well, yeah, I can always measure along the horizontal direction in millimeters or whatever length you're trying to use. But what does it mean then once you plug a value along the X direction in millimeters, right, into an equation like this, you had better have that equation set up so that when you plug a value of length into that equation, you also get a value of length out of that function, right? Like that, they needs to have everything in there to make that happen. And that's why these other unit labels are in here, right? If you think about for a term that has no X's in it, you have to have the units built in so that the uh, type of number that comes out of there is in millimeters, right? Or is in some form of length at least, right? So that's why they have that one multiplied by millimeters. The second term in this equation has no unit labels in it. Why not? Okay, think of what units X would be in, right? X is going to be in some kind of unit of length, right? So if you just multiply it by a pure constant with no units in it, you are also going to get a unit of length out. Right, so that one doesn't need any additional kind of uh, you know units along with the coefficient that make it work, right? And we can keep going with them. If you have a uh, a length cubed, right? 
for the value that you plug into that third term, you only really want a length coming out of that, not a length cubed, and so you have to divide out two of those millimeters if you want for the units to be uh, kind of compatible with the rest of the sum, right? And you can go on to the fourth power as well, works the same way, right? You need to divide out all but one of those length units in order to make that work, okay? So that's kind of the first thing I'd talk through is that very often when students first see an equation with all the units in it, it kind of freaks them out a little bit. Don't worry about it. Generally, we have them set up to where they kind of work if you ignore the units, right? But we have them there so that we're doing it formally correctly. Um, but in case the units aren't all compatible with each other, it at least gives you the roadmap for how you would do unit conversions to make the input and the output what you would want to be out of your function. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's, you know, just talking through that. Um, what, is our, what are our basic equations to find our x centroid and our y centroid? What is it we're going to try to use to find the x and y centroid of this shape, you think? Any thoughts? Okay. There were a couple of equations we had, right, for, for the um, x direction. I think we had something that looked something like this. The integral of x dA over the integral of dA. And if you want to kind of focus this just a little bit more, sometimes people will put a little indicator on this integral, like something like this, where they say A. First thing I want to talk about is, what does that mean? I'll say that bothered me when I first saw that, and you know, when I was dealing with calculus or whatever, and they'd put a little no, a note right, right, right there like that. And I'd be like, I don't know what to do with that. That's not actually limits of integration, right? Because that's what I expect would go there, would lim be limits of integration. What do I do with that? And so let me explain it. That is a note you can use in some calculus notation that basically says, we don't know yet enough about your function to tell you how to plug in the limits, right? So what we're going to do is leave a general note there that says, whatever the area is, make sure you pick your limits so that you cover it, right? And so it's more of a general note, not so much a specific note. It says, make sure you figure that out. Whatever you got to do with your limits of integration, just make sure you pick them so that you cover the area, right? That's what that little note there means, okay? Um, we also had another form of this for the y direction. What did that look like? Same thing, right? What was different? The only thing different was we said we're going to take those y coordinates instead of the x coordinates, but everything else in the equation was still the same. Okay? So let me actually give you a quick interpretation geometrically of what these formulas actually say for this curve. Okay? Here's what they say. Um, we can take this curve, and just like you've seen in some of your calculus classes, it is possible for you to sort of take a uh, sort of a sample little rectangle out of this curve and set it up so that the limits of that rectangle height-wise basically lie right there in the shaded area, right? And this is sort of the starting point a lot of times whenever you're having a calculus discussion, you say, well, okay, what's your differential element? That's kind of the fancy word for that, but you set up what are the little bits and pieces you're going to imagine splitting this thing up into in order to think about evaluating the integral, okay? For us, this is interesting because what we need to do is imagine the centroid of that rectangle because when we look at the x in this equation or the y in that equation, what those refer to are the specific x and y coordinates of any general little piece of material that we split this up into, right? That's what the x means there, and that's what the y means there. So once we get our sort of sample uh, little bit of area we're going to split this into, right, that could be anywhere along this length, we're doing it kind of generally for any, any spot along this length, we have to imagine the centroid of that piece and that's what we're going to have to plug in for the x or y for these equations over here, okay? Um, and so let's actually think about what would the coordinates be of that point, 
right? I just said that's the little centroid of that little rectangle we split this into. What are the coordinates of that point? Okay, one of them's easy, right? Whenever we think about um, the variable of integration, basically what that's saying is what's that coordinate, right? How far is it from the origin to where the location is of that piece, right? And because we're doing it for general any x, this is just going to be x, right? So that's the easy one, is that we know already we can just call the uh, location of the centroid of that rectangle just x, okay? What about the y location of the centroid of that rectangle? Okay, we have to do a little more work for this one because first of all, we have to come up with how tall is that rectangle, right? And they're all measured from the x-axis down here. That makes this a little bit easier, right? But this rectangle is just going to be whatever the value is of the function that we are given, right? The height of that rectangle right there is whatever comes out of this equation when we plug in x, right? So it's literally this equation is what comes out of there. And the way we write that in terms of a, you know, a, a notation on here is we can call this, um, in, I guess in our case, because I called this y of x, I'll just call this y of x, okay? But I'll tell you what, um, I'm gonna, uh, let me change that up just a little bit. I say that's not incorrect because that's what we called this function over here. But a more general way to write it is you take whatever function you are given, and I'll, so I'll just call that f of x, you take whatever function you are given and plug in your x value, and that gives you the height of that rectangle, right? Because that was the point of that function in the first place. So I'll tell you what, I'll erase that, and we'll call that height f of x, okay? Well, now what? I said we need to figure out where the coordinate is of the centroid of that rectangle, right? So where is it? Okay, since it's a rectangle, we can use symmetry and say a rectangle, any axis or plane or point of symmetry that you have on, a, on any shape is going to contain the centroid, right? So on this little rectangle right here, because uh, we have an axis of symmetry halfway between the bottom and the top, we know that the centroid has to lie right there, and therefore the length from the bottom of the rectangle up to that point is just going to be whatever the function value is over two, right? It's just half of that height, okay? All right, so I've talked through like what the x and the y mean in these equations right here. What does the dA mean? One more time. Yeah, you have to kind of think about for this little rectangle that we have right here, what would the length and width, or excuse me, I guess uh, width and height be of that rectangle, right? So let me, I'm going to shade that in there. That thing has a little bit of area associated with it. One of the dimensions is pretty easy. What is that dimension? Okay, f, f of x, right? So we can say that our dA value, which is a little differential amount of area, is going to be equal to that f of x, but we need a, a width as well, okay? And if we're going to do this exactly, right, and not, not some finite element sort of a approximation of it, if we're going to do it exactly, how wide do each one of these little rectangles need to be? infinitesimally small where there's an infinite number of them, right? And so uh, what we do to represent that in calculus terms is we typically call that a little differential value, right? Meaning it's a little width. And since we're measuring that directly along the x-axis, that's just going to be dx, right? So for dA, it's just f of x dx. And that's true for both of these two expressions, both um, x, x sub c and, x, and y sub c, right, where you're trying to figure out what those, um, 
those centroid locations are. The DA in all of these is this expression over here. We just plug in f of x dx. Okay? And because of this, you know, we can actually simplify these expressions a little bit and we can say x sub c is going to be equal to the integral of x times f of x, whatever that function value is, dx, okay? And then sometimes what people will do is for the limits of this integration, they'll call these like maybe x1 or x2, that notation isn't standardized, but it's basically whatever your left limit is of your integration to cover the amount of area that you're supposed to get over to whatever your right limit is, right? So that's what you do for this, and then what do you put in the denominator, you think? Okay, everything's the same, it's just now you have to plug in whatever your function is, right, without the x in front of it, times dx. Okay, what about y sub c? This is the one that trips more people up. Okay, again, we can take the integral form where we go from the left limit to the right limit. Okay. But we just said a second ago that the location of the centroid of that rectangle is equal to the function over 2, right? So this is basically going to be, the y part of this is going to be f of x over 2. And then dA is going to be the same as it was before, right? f of x dx, right? And then what do you put in the denominator? Same thing I did for the x sub c, right? It's still just the area that's enclosed there. So um, we'll, there we'll just put f of x. Oops, put the equals too soon. f of x dx. Okay? And you can see in this uh, expression that I put in the numerator for y sub c, you have f of x in there twice. So a lot of times what you will do is you will see people, uh, you know, consolidate that and call this, I mean, I'll just put another equal sign over here, integral from x1 to x2 of f of x squared over 2 dx, run out of space over here, over the same thing we had in the denominator, right? Um, so I'm just going to use my tools here. <clears throat> there we go. All right, so that is essentially what we're going to do. For our x sub c, we're going to try to implement this expression in the calculator, all right, to make our lives a little bit easier. And then for, that, for the y direction, we're going to try to implement this one over here in the calculator. Okay, we up for that? Okay, so starting with x sub c, um, we do actually have a little bit of an issue, right? How do I know what to plug in for x1 and x2? Yeah. Basically, I need to solve for the zeros of this function, and I've got two of them, right? I've got one over here, and I've got another one over there. Does this calculator solve uh, fourth power equations? This is the calculator I'm planning on using. Does it solve fourth power equations? Do you know? It actually stops at third power, okay? So if you have a third power equation or less, you can use another function in this thing and it can give you all the roots, right, for first, second, or third order uh, polynomials. But uh, if you go to fourth, it can't give you all the roots. So what should we do? Okay, we're not gonna give up yet. What we're going to do instead is we're going to use another solver that's built into this calculator that isn't made to give you all the roots. It's made to give you a root, 
right, that you get to pick basically by uh, judiciously choosing what your initial guess is going to be, okay? So what we need to do is take this function, and again, I mentioned how the, uh, the units are basically just gonna drop out. That basically means I can just plug this function in with just the coefficients, and I don't have to worry about the units as I plug this in, okay? And here's what we'll do. We're going to set this equation equal to zero because that's where this uh, curve crosses, right? So we'll set that function equal to zero. So I'll do 21 plus four times x, right? Minus uh, 0.25 x cubed, okay? And if you're curious what I'm doing here, I'm just literally picking the x variable that's available right there by typing alpha and then where that x variable is. So that's going to be cubed, okay? And then um, what's the next term? Minus 0 0.03, okay, times x to the fourth power. All right, and then all this I said we're going to set equal to zero. And when I do that, I type that whole thing in. The numerical solver I mentioned a second ago that finds a root, what you do to get that is you hit shift solve, and it's going to start off with a value here as an initial guess, right? It'll start with something because it's whatever, probably whatever was stored in your calculator from before, okay? What if you don't like its initial guess? Like for us, let's say I'm trying to find that left zero over there. I probably want to pick something relatively co close to where it crosses. How do you know that? Well, sometimes you can make a judicious guess. If you've got a nice plot like this, it gives you that information pretty close, right? Just not exact. So we need something close to what? Okay, that's minus five and then maybe a few others. I mean, how about we try like minus six? Okay, negative six. All you do is you type in negative six here and you hit equals, okay? And it will chug through that and into your x variable, it will have stored now where that curve crosses, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I want to be able to still use my x variable for other things, but also save what this number is, okay? What do you think I should do for that? Okay, what you can do is on the next uh, you know, time you do another calculation, you can take X and up above the RCL button right here, you see STO, right? We're going to store that, whatever that value is in X, and uh, tell you what, I'll just use E and F over here, okay? So stored into my variable E now is where that curve crosses, um, you know, the X coordinate where this curve crosses zero. With me? What do I need to do to get the coordinate over there where that curve crosses zero? Okay, same thing. The only difference is, right, sometimes you can even, well, it's not letting me go back up and grab that, so I'm going to type it in again, so that's okay. 21, right, plus 4x, oops, um, it is a good idea to explicitly do your multiplications, even though sometimes it picks it up okay. Um, I always recommend explicitly doing your multiplications in these things. Okay, minus 0.25 uh, times x uh, raised to the third power, minus 0.03 times x raised to the fourth power. Okay, we'll set this equal to zero, shift solve, and now in order to pick that right one, we might want to pick something close to five or so. Okay, so I'll just type five there and then hit equals, and you'll notice that it will now pick out another solution to this same equation, just by choosing your initial guess differently. Okay, so that gives me 4.66 seven, nine, three, blah, 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 blah. Tell me, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take that and now store it into F. Okay. 
All right, so now I've got where these two crossings occur. What do I do next? Okay. You might notice that this calculator actually does have a little uh, integration symbol on here, right? It's also got a little fraction symbol, right? I'm going to put in the fraction first and then put a, an integral. You think this is a good idea? Yet? Tell you what, one of the things that happens whenever you're trying to enter a big old function or something in there, sometimes you run out of character space, okay? What's a way to deal with that for this calculator? For the, and at this calculator doing this equation. Is there a way I can split up the tasks? Yeah. What's one task I have to do here? Just find the area, right? That's going to be in the denominator of both pieces of my problem, right? Let me just do that one first. The equation I need to enter is just going to be 21 plus 4 times x, okay? Uh, minus 0.25 times x raised to the third power uh, minus 0.03 times x raised to the fourth power dx. What else do I need on here? My limits, right? So, but since I've got my limits stored into my variables, why don't I recall those and just go from E up to F, right? Because isn't that where I stored those? The left limit was in E and the right limit was in F. So I'm going to just plug those in like that and hit equals. Now, on this computer, uh, that runs pretty fast, right? Because I've got the entire processor of my computer doing that for this emulator. Your calculator may go a lot slower than that whenever you get ready to do it. Uh, but anyway, uh, this gives us 199.098-ish, okay? So let me store that into A, okay? Now that I've got that stored into A, should I go forward with this X sub C equation? I think I shall. All right, we'll plug in a, an integral there where the inside the integral we're going to have 21 plus 4x minus 0.25 times, whoop, and I didn't do what I mentioned earlier there. I always definitely uh, recommend doing your multiplications explicitly. All right, 0.25 times x uh, raised to the third power, okay, uh, minus 0.03 times x raised to the fourth power. And in the denominator, I'm going to put a. In the lower limit, I'm going to put e, what's stored in e. And in the upper limit, I'm going to put f. Thank you so much. Someone just said, aren't you missing a term in there? You're missing the x. Good catch, right? I, I was moving forward just doing the f of x because that's kind of the more laborsome part of it is entering the f of x. What do I have to do in addition to that? Okay, I have to take all of that, okay, and uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get back into that. Let me uh, see if I can get there. There we go. I need to take all of that, put it in parentheses, and multiply it by x, right? I've got to scroll all the way to the other end here and put another parenthesis on there. All right, that would have given me the wrong answer if I hadn't done that. So appreciate the, you know, guidance there. All right, so there's my equation. I should be able to hit equals and come up with a value for where my x centroid is. All right, it's going to be at negative 0.6207. All right. Uh-oh, I don't have it there. I should have checked this before I came in. Um, are we close, though? Actually, do I have it there? I do have it there. Sorry, I mis, uh, misremembered one of my digits, and it made me think we didn't have it. I do have it. All right, 
0.6207, if you round that to the next thing, is going to be negative 0.621, right? So that's going to be this value right here. Okay, so we have a, an answer for that one, H. Okay, um, what do we do for the other one? Okay, not much different, right? What's the only thing that changes really? Okay, I guess I should have my equation that I can look at again. It's again going to be equal to, uh, in the numerator I'll put the integral again, of, and uh, let me not forget this time to put my parentheses there, right? So I'm going to have to take this function that I put in here and square it and divide by 2, right? So actually one way I can do that is just multiply by 0.5, right? That's like dividing by 2. And here I will put in 21 plus 4x minus 0.25 times x cubed minus 0.03 uh, times x to the fourth power, okay? And then everything there in the parentheses, I want to square, right? Because I'm going to do this function squared over 2, right? And then what about the denominator? Okay, actually limits here going from E to F that I found earlier, right? And what about the denominator? I still have that area, same one, right? So plug in an A value there and hit equals. This says that ends up being 9.357 or so. I'll try not to mess up uh, reading my answer here again. Um, Okay, so that's 9.357, there we go, F. Okay, another thing that's not a bad idea to do sometimes once you get an answer like this is try to figure out on your drawing here, where is that, right? That's not a bad idea to kind of just check yourself a little bit. Turns out that this drawing that I have up here is actually fully to scale, right? So that'll help you uh, in certain cases if you have a drawing that's fully to scale to, uh, to know where that is. I'm not sure you should count on that, but at least this one I'll tell you it is, and we can go in and we can check out and see if this looks like it's right. So where is negative 0.621? Okay, if it's five units from, from here over to here, right, you're talking about half a unit, so think about ish, right? Think about dividing that up into 10 pieces. It's going to just be barely a little bit to the left, right? So it's going to be, you know, some coordinate that might be kind of along that range or so. What about the vertical direction? Right, that's this one right here. What about the vertical direction? 9.357, okay? Again, it's, it's five units from here to here. You're almost to the 10, so you're just barely below the 10 there. Somewhere maybe right about there. Does that look reasonable? Okay, good, because, you know, that is another check you can do. What if I had said, you know, another one of these answers, let's say, I mean, I, I'm not sure, maybe these answers are spaced too closely together to really get something out of this, but let's take an extreme. What if I looked at answer A in the Y direction? Where would that be? Okay, five, seven and a half would be actually halfway between five and 10, right? Agree with that? So is it possible that it could have been there? It looks to me less likely, right? Like that doesn't look like that's as close to the overall center of that area as the first one that I marked, right? So because of that, and I don't want to cause confusion, I'm going to delete that. All right, any questions about that process?
Okay, I'm going to point out one more time, even though I did a lot of talking at the beginning of what it even meant to, for these equations to be here, right? I did a lot of like explaining of where do those come from and what the differential element is and all that. Did you really need to do those? Let's review like what the essential steps were to get the answers. You had to find the zeros, so that was like putting in your equation two times with two different initial conditions, or excuse me, not in, uh, two different initial guesses, right? And figuring out where those zeros were, storing them. Then you did a quick calculation of the area just by putting the function, the initial function, right into your uh, you know, tool that you have in your calculator for an integral using those limits we put in there and coming up with the area. And then you had one more integral to do where you did x times f of x, and you did one more integral where you did f of x squared over 2, right? So really, even though I spent a good bit of time explaining it, this is a very fast problem to do if you know what you're doing and you have a calculator that does this stuff. Okay, so wanted to kind of mention that too before we close it out. Any last minute questions? All right, thank you for your attention. <laughs>